next uh, 45 minutes or 50 minutes um i will begin with the uh, the concept of uh, uh, the repo development i will skip on the assessment because uh, that in itself take at least 10 to 15 minutes to just broadly cover it so i think whenever we talk about induction and intubation we have to think about if the patient is safe to induce and also we need to think about if the child especially has got anxiety about uh, the whole process of anesthesia are the parents anxious about the whole process of anesthesia so i think if i make this statement saying that if somebody says that um, i will give a good anesthesia keep the ch child hemodynamically stable surgeon will say i'll do my best job and the surgery will be over and doesn't matter even if we don't have a very good or smooth induction but at the end everything will be all right you know so is the, is that the right statement to make or is it okay this approach is okay so i think it's not the really right statement the reason being uh, there are a lot of uh, implications of not so smooth induction um, which can be short term effects and also can be long term effect short term effects in term of uh, in terms of emergence delirium they don't wake up very smooth intraop they required higher concentration of uh, analgesic drugs and also they seem to be more tachy tachycardic throughout the procedure whereas the long term effects is what we are really really worried they develop negative post operative behavioral changes things like uh, when they grow up as an adult they develop uh, sleep disturbances they have got this uh, behavioral changes separation anxiety about lot of things and then they develop this you know they can be new onset aneurysms in children so uh, it is very important to think about a proper plan for induction provided it's safe now then you can have another school of thought where people will say or the anesthetists will say why should i bother you know when there is so much of impact about a bad induction then might as well keep all my children sedated and that's also a good plan um again uh, let's see if we can uh, strike a balance between the two because uh, remember any medication you give there is a side effect and you need to be very careful in what you give um and you should give what is only needed so let's say if we can see uh, the predictors of not only anxiety but the need of pre medications so in terms of uh, anxiolysis uh, the major factors which play part are age temperament and the education status of the parents if they are able to explain children what the child is coming for so let's take one by one so coming to age if the children if a infant who is less than 6 months they barely have separation anxiety and so we don't need really any pre medication to allay that anxiety so and it's between 6 months to 9 months they start to develop anxiety but what happens if your uh, caregiver or the anesthetist is gentle then it's it's not so difficult to separate them from the parents without any anxiolysis or without any pre medication now in this age group 1 to 3 year if this is a very tricky age group where uh, there is maximum amount of separation anxiety the understanding of whole procedure is very minimal so they don't this age group children they don't really accept even a gentle staff friendly environment may or may not affect them and this is a age group which may need pre medication so you do you see how the patient is and based on uh that you give pre medication especially in this age group coming to 4 to 7 years uh, this age group again is anxious but their anxiety is mostly to do with the surgery if their body part will get hurt or if they die these are the basic worries in them so if you explain even carefully and in detail to these uh, kids usually it helps and they become very cooperative if you talk to them and you build rapport with them and it is a friendly environment in this age group which is really really beneficial coming to this 8 to 15 years age group they, these are very strong they look very strong and they look very uh, uh, brave kids inside there will be a lot of anxieties and worries and they are scared but they don't want to show it they want to behave like a lion you know and then uh, thing is friendly environment talking to them detailed explanation of procedure in itself is more than enough and they usually don't need pre medication until unless there is you know they are out of this uh, two standard deviations so if i have to talk about if i have to summarize the 
plan of uh, pre medication or anxiolysis it has to be individualized plan it has to be based on the child and uh, unnecessary and too less both are not uh, good so um, i think plan your see your child and plan for anxiolysis now once you have decided that your child needs pre medication now question comes which drug should i give how much should i give which route i should use and what exactly is my target so your target basically is to cre to uh, create anxiolysis your target is not to have a sleeping child so i think lot of uh, anesthetists i see they try to put the child to sleep with with the uh, medication and they give very high doses problem is these drugs act for some duration of uh, longer duration of time if you're giving long acting drug and then you add intraoperatively some fentanyl you add some other uh, sedatives and you add some more analgesics and everything uh, you know all the action sums up and in post operative either this child sleeps for very long time or they can have respiratory distress etc so choose your drug carefully if i have to choose i will choose a short acting drug something like midazolam um route which is non invasive like oral route and then doses for midazolam is something like 0.5 to 0.7 mg per kg um and it you must know how long will it take so that you can time your drug something like 20 to 30 minutes it take for midazolam effect to come so um that's how you have to plan uh, for your drug also you should know what are the side effects let's say if i'm choosing midazolam i know it is bitter in taste so i need to have uh, add either sugar or i need to add some juice happy juice to kind of mask that bad if a bad taste and i must tell the child that you know it's going to be sweet and don't worry and you need to tell whatever you're doing you need to tell your uh, children so you when i mean by friendly atmo atmosphere it, you have to cater it cater it to your child so, you know you can see in this video that this child is so playful he's so excited about all these toys and then finally the one he is picking up now he kept playing with this child and we induced the child um as um, as um, he was playing so um so pre medication uh is one to do with anxiolysis there are other reasons also why you pre medicate the patient things like if you are planning to uh, deal with a difficult airway or planning to do fiber optic then you have to reduce secretions then you may have to give drugs like glycopyrrolate in appropriate doses like 10 mics per kg and uh, sometimes the few children are high risk for aspiration and then you need to give drugs like uh, ranitidine or um, you know prokinetic drugs so uh, coming to parental presence and no parental uh, presence i am a very uh, big proponent of parental presence as you can see this mother is such a big help to the team and she is the one actually doing most of the job and the child she kept talking and the child slept off with the um, inhalational induction uh, it goes unsaid that whenever you are planning for anesthesia preparation is the most important part because of lack of time i am not going to go in detail of how to prepare for a theater when it comes to a child but the basic steps like machine check equipment check making sure that's appropriate size equipment and their functioning are available in, especially in children you have to ensure that ot temperature says Uh, uh within the range if you are dealing with a new unit it there should be overhead warmer to keep the atmosphere appropriate for the baby now uh you have to load your drugs both anesthesia and resuscitation drugs they are very prone for respiratory complications so we we keep um, um we keep succinylcholine preloaded and also we keep atropin preloaded because their cardiac output is heart rate dependent you also have to remember the technician who is helping you with all the procedure that person should be updated with your plans now coming to the how to induce a child there are only two ways one is inhalational induction another is iv induction so uh, most of the children undergo inhalational induction until unless they have a iv cannula already in place place because of some reason either they are on antibiotics or some other medication which is going on or the child agrees for cannula which is a rare situation only the bigger kids allow us to put iv cannula or they are high risk for aspiration whenever safety uh, safety is a 
safe you have to ensure that safety is taken care of and then only the second step comfort comes so in this case if the patient is very high risk of aspiration then you have to ensure that you secure iv and then induce iv um, via iv and uh, then you you know you proceed with your anesthesia there are some rare situation like malignant hypothermia where you don't want to give inhalational agents or there are situations where inhalational agents are contraindicated there you go for aggressively go for iv induction if i may start off with inhalational induction because 90% of our inductions are inhalational so um, there are two drugs which are used commonly for inhalational induction one is sevoflurane other is halothane unfortunately halothane is not available to most of us uh, the if you look at two properties here in this diagram one is blood gas partition coefficient which is 0.69 for sevo and halothane 2.5 and the reason why only these two drugs are talking is because they are the only drugs which are pleasant all other are either pun pungent or unpleasant so only two options exist really sevo and halo and now you if you look at blood gas partition coefficient for sevo is very low whereas halo is high what does it mean it means the induction is faster with sevo and the exit or emergence also is faster with sevo so that is why we now we choose sevo uh, fluorine actually over even halothane and halothane as you know sensitizes the heart for um, you know sympathetic stimulation and then can cause junctional arrhythmias and there have been case reports of arrest uh, happening with halothane Uh, so for various reason halothane has been uh, now uh, not available at least to us so we go for sevoflurane induction so now other thing is important you remember the child who may agree to go to undergo inhalational induction halfway through may decide not to cooperate so you need to make sure the speed of induction is fast and how can you do it use nitrous oxide this is the only place where we actually use nitrous oxide and the second guess definitely effect is um, you know in important and clinically significant you also can uh, use higher concentration provided the child accepts the smell though smell though we say sevoflurane is pleasant but when it's a day to day note uh, observation that once you cross 3% and 4% sevoflurane then what happens is the they start to kind of withdraw themselves from inhalational in, uh, gases other things what you can do is if the child is breathing anyway they a little bit they hyperventilate at this point because some uh, some kind of stress is there inside uh, even if they are complying and they are accepting mask but there is some stress at this point and they they seem to be hyperventilating most of the time and you can add cpap this all will help in enhancing the speed of induction <clears throat> so there are many ways of uh, giving inhalational induction and the first and most common is incremental induction i will just uh, show this video and explain as it goes so uh, we have our post graduate who is explaining the process of inhalational induction she is the mother there is the one more an senior anesthetist and technician so you can see for inhalational induction you need two three people around to help you so this uh, child is uh, breathing there is some leak so mask really not uh, fitting so well because he is keeping it very gently on the face and as you see nitrous is there in higher concentration 4 and 2 and then slowly as the child accepts sevo the dial setting is increased so there is slowly dial setting has now come to 4 or uh, 5% she is still accepting she is breathing all right mother is continuously holding hand and she is around and she is talking to her and then slowly she sleeps sleeps off okay once she sleeps off further monitor apart from saturation probe is put in so she is still responding to verbal but actually she is you know transition to anesthesia so you can see 6% sevo is there so this is a technique of inhalational uh, incremental inhalational induction once she sleeps off mother goes out and then rest of the monitors are placed right now there is only saturation probe so uh, that's one way the other way is single breath vital capacity technique we don't practice this too much because you need a lot of cooperation even bigger children don't cooperate so much what really we do here we ask the child to maximally exhale and after that take a deep breath breath hold 
and then with one single breath this uh, this baby or the child goes to sleep if they are not able to take vital capacity then you ask them to take at least two big breaths usually you need 5 years plus children to uh, cooperate but in in our day to day practice we don't see children cooperating this much so this is almost we we rarely use this technique <laughs> now this is again one more uh, technique where the children you know they have first uh, case in the day they are, they come sleepy because it's a normal night sleep going on and uh, then we do steel induction what really we do here is we again give nitrous oxide in higher concentration for second gas effect 4 and 2 and then again in incremental doses we increase sevoflurane the child keeps sleeping and we introduce mask we introduce mask to the child and slowly come close you don't go and touch because they are just sleepy there is not a pre medicated child it's just a sleeping child so if you go and keep the mask on the patient the child will wake up and then he'll be the most uncooperative child and you usually don't talk in your holding bay or uh, operation theater because uh, verbal stimulus also stimulates them and then wake up usually we talk to each other in sign language at this point of time so you can see it's already 6% reach and then we get the baby to the bed once we are we feel that it's deep you don't have mac remember you don't have your mac you don't know really depth so while transition they usually move a little bit continue to give mask uh, you, you know your inhalational agent and uh, and put them to sleep but there is usually with this transition some movement happens and uh, that's when they you know after that they go to sleep so uh, while you are inducing remember few uh, unanticipated a few anticipated problems in specific children you have to be mindful of like uh, especially if your child is not deep and you are trying to poke in for a iv or you are trying to manipulate the position or change the position they can go into laryngospasm whenever they the plane is not deep and the stimulation is given there is always this chance of laryngospasm so you must be aware remember if you have not got iv you must have a plan b ready is how to give succamethonium in case the laryngospasm is significant also remember their heart rate is very important especially for the smaller children their cardiac output is heart rate dependent so um, if you induce uh, small babies or a downs baby where you realize uh, that you know their tendency to go on brady is high and if they land up in a if you land up in a difficult iv uh, securing difficult iv then uh, you must have a plan b to keep your heart rate up which is usually i am atropine or you can also give sublingual i have given i am atropine i have not given sublingual atropine yet now uh, these are the various methods of uh, i inhalational induction now coming to iv induction uh, see you need to remember one thing children are needle phobic i don't know whether they have so much of problem with that small prick but they are needle phobic phobic they don't want to see needle coming close to them so even if you put emla and prilocaine it can work if you have explained enough or it may not work if it, because they are just scared of the sight of the needle so you have to be mindful of these things uh, just by putting emla doesn't ensure that you know your iv is going to be smooth uh, obviously if you have iv in place then this induction via iv is very rapid and smooth and nothing like it it's very easy then the drugs you use uh, thiopentone is a drug of choice for me but it's not available and propofol is what is available with us propofol the biggest problem is the pain caused by propofol sometimes they cry even more than what they cried actually for the iv induction uh, iv placement so the pain is uh, quite a lot and then you need to think about how to you know um, uh, look after this pain uh, you can give fentanyl you can give uh, lignocaine either mix it or give before um, after applying tunicate but remember one thing the children don't uh, allow you to do a lot of things on them so uh, propofol is painful and usually even if you give them slowly and diluted form they complain of pain in in our experience that's what we have seen and then um, you know relaxant use for iv induction is most of the time atracurium in children and you plan for maintenance which is usually isoflurane based 
until unless new nates where we used to uh, where we give sieve fluorine now another mode of uh, induction which we must discuss is rapid sequence induction or in a newer format modified rapid sequence induction for children so uh, for this the eligibility criteria is you need to have an iv in place um there are few component of rapid sequence induction you have to pre oxygenate again do you remember in children they uh, i don't have a video it's very difficult to take a video of rapid sequence induction so remember uh, children don't allow you to pre oxygenate for very long time bigger ones do the younger and smaller ones don't so you give oxygen as much as you can um then uh, coming to the other component what drugs you will give uh, uh, since we have propofol available we give propofol if you have thio thio is better drug you can give thio and then give scoline um, we do modified rsi so we add some fentanyl to it so as to um, you know suppress the sympathetic response of um, uh, intubation and uh, then uh, your uh, relaxant which is uh, which can be either succinylcholine which is short acting quick onset short acting drug or it can be rocuronium which is quick onset but longer duration drug so it depends on what kind of patient you are dealing and what are the concerns with the patient so um coming to cricoid pressure there have been a lot of controversies regarding cricoid pressure because uh, it seems there is a basic question which is a basic uh, basic fact which is under questioning is that whether esophagus really is posterior to trachea because the whole process depends on the very fact that esophagus lies posterior to trachea and you can press uh, cricoid and you can kind of square squash this esophagus between the vertebra and the you know the anterior pressure so um, now the the evidence is uh, showing that esophagus lies left to uh, trachea towards the left side posteriorly so it may or may not be benefit uh, beneficial now in children apart from this uh, there are many other issues like the cricoid ring is really really narrow and what it means it means that your finger may be broader or wider than the cricoid uh, you know the cricoid width so you are not able to give really properly the cricoid pressure second thing is the airway is really anterior so if you give a lot of pressure on cricoid anteriorly your epiglottis and the airway also gets distorted which makes your intubation difficult so because of various reasons we don't practice giving cricoid pressure in smaller children and then another important thing associated with rapid sequence induction is that you don't give bag and mask ventilation but in modified rapid sequence induction uh, you you can give a gentle bag and mask ventilation but gentle means less than 12 cm of water so you have to be mindful that you are not inflating stomach and it's just the basic little chest rise is what you are looking for now uh, this this was about our uh, this was about our uh, induction coming to intubation so uh, in very quick in this slide a uh, short recap you see the head is big till 2 years so neck is generally flexed so you need to put shoulder roll so the airway is anterior which means the the glottis is at the level of c3 c4 whereas in adults glottis is at the level of c4 c5 you look here the pediatric uh, epiglottis is omega shape and uh, it can really cover um, if you put your laryngoscope in bellicula it can really close down and uh, you know block your view um, and uh, i don't know whether you're funnelist or non funnelist but if you believe that cricoid is the narrowest portion then uh, and the the larynx uh, and the airway looks like a funnel um then or if you believe in subglottic is the nervous portion and cricoid is the rigid ring so uh, in both the cases you have to be mindful that uh, if you are using cuff tube cuff should not go and cause trauma should not cause mucosal injury otherwise it will land up in subglottic stenosis so intubation you need to put a shoulder roll in less than 2 years position is very important you are trying to keep the nose and sternum almost or chin or sternum almost at the same level you here we are using cuff tube with stylet stylet has to be plastic and we are using straight blade in this neonate 
and you can see how he is giving pressure with this little finger himself so you don't need two three people because the baby is very tiny you don't need two three people you know crowding here you can do most of the things on your own uh, again this is just touching on whether you should use cuffed or uncuffed whatever you use sizing has to be good cuff pressure should be monitored here regularly that needs to be always looked after so your cuff pressure should always be less than in neonates and all 50 less than 15 cm of water whereas in adults it can be less than 20 cm of water now uh, th with this our induction and uh, intubation is over now coming to maintenance phase so maintenance phase we cannot discuss too much here because th there is no end to this phase it depends on Uh, what your surgery is it depends on what kind of patient you have and based on that your preparation will decide how and uh, preparation will be based on that and uh, these things will decide how your maintenance phase will go so uh, monitoring apart from your standard asa grade monitoring uh, which you can see here this this monitor is showing immediately after induction you can see the mac is so high you can see ba baby is still uh, you know breathing and usually at the time of induction we use only pulse oximeter but immediately after we put all the monitors and then you position your patient um, and then your maintenance strat strategies can be inhalational ba based and uh, paralysis based um, you know uh main maintenance of anesthesia or it can be tiva total intravenous agents it can be dci it can be uh, only regional with some sedation it depends really on what patient you are de dealing with and what surgery it is the important thing during maintenance uh, time for a child which we should never forget is temperature they have tendency to go hypothermic and you have to ensure that room temperature they have been pre operatively warmed intraoperative uh, active and passive warming is in place you can see is humidifier you can see how is this covered this all passive and then there is a bear hugger going so there is active warming going on in this child so they are like literally mummy fight uh, in terms of fluid again based on what surgery it is uh, there is there is need of maintenance fluid Uh, there is need of uh, losses, a fluid to replace losses. Whatever you do, uh, you need to think about in very small children whether you need to add dextrose or no dextrose. Even if you decide to give dextrose, usually one to two percent dextrose alone is needed. And uh, the total maintenance uh, fluid requirement is uh, calculated by Holiday-Seeger formula. And you really don't need the full amount of fluid to be given because the babies are not in anabolic phase at this point of time, but they are in catabolic phase. So you need to give around sixty, fifty to sixty percent of total calculated fluid only. And the most important thing is how you give fluid. So if you are planning to give RL, which is isotonic fluid. You you using burette and you are actually calculating. I need to give thirty ml per hour. So you fill your burette with the amount of fluid what you need to give. Now coming to analgesia, yeah, I will just you know this is the only slide. Dr. Elsa is going to talk more about all this. So here you can see uh, analgesia yeah, is very very important. You can give systemically, but I will say. for children regional is very 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 important in our practice we give around 90% of the patient gets regional and the most commonly given uh, block is caudal as is shown it has to be sterile and you know you palpate and then you give you aspirate and in this child you can see we are giving continuous epidural catheter and he has undergone actually a major liver surgery but you look at him he really look very low and he is talking to his uh, mom so uh, you know you can really have major surgeries done very uh, comfortable patients after uh, with the help of regional now coming to important part uh, which is uh, now your surgery is over maintenance you did good job now comes extubation so if you see this apricot study in or it clearly mentions the, all the respiratory events like laryngospasm bronchospasm aspiration or strider the chances of them having in extubation period is far more than in intubation period so it's uh, so extubation period cannot be taken lightly and the seniors should always be around during this phase and then extubation can be done awake and can be done deep awake extubation is a safe way to extubate make sure your child is not coughing too much 
uh, importance of this awake extubation is even if your para staff uh, paramedic staff is not really not paramedic the staff uh, recovery staff is not really very equipped with the knowledge of handling experience is limited then you must ensure that you keep the patient awake all the time and uh, only thing with this is do not allow these patients to cough on tube so if your analgesia is good and if you know how to extubate at when mac is around 0.2 uh, they do fairly well now a uh, deep extubation is a not i have just kind of uh, show, i'll show you this video deep extubation means your patient has to be really deep mac of around 1.4 you can see this patient is already on psv pro mode he is 8 kgs and he is almost uh, you know uh, the uh, tidal volume is uh, 9 9 ml so he is breathing very well stimulus he is not responding keep and i always an eye on respiration so you know all these things are taken out but this baby's breathing pattern is not changing which in itself is telling us that he is uh, fairly deep so once you are done that if you are doing even the uh, the intubation also if you extubate if you are extubating a endotracheal tube also the same process you follow and you always keep an eye on respiration once you are done this give a good deep suction make sure you are happy with the respiration extubation criteria make sure you are giving high fio2 It doesn't mean you have to give 100% fio2 you can see here we are giving 70% fio2 and then your mac is still deep 1.2 okay and he is breathing quite fairly all right respiratory respiratory rate is okay hemodynamically stable and we are really drop down to six pressure and then you extubate uh he is breathing and then you ensure that you they, sometimes you need to give jaw thrust to no bleeding no other issues and then you shift this patient and uh, if the if your recovery is very far from uh, your theater then you have to have some kind of monitoring and you need to have some oxygen uh, going in this uh, baby so transport is very very important uh, once you have transported the patient to recovery room or uh, pacu post operative uh, anesthesia care uh then recovery starts so, so recovery is uh, usually in there are three phases of recovery early is what we anesthetists are um actively involved with where awakening and recovery of vital reflexes are uh, uh, happens and then there's something called immediate recovery where the uh, patients are in the ward and they are now getting ready to be discharged to home and late recovery is the recovery time period when the baby or the child comes back to his full psychological uh, full physiological and psychological recovery uh, happens for the child so these are three phases we are directly involved with the early phase remember uh, you should not forget about your patient after you shift the patient to pack you because very much in pack you the responsibility of patient is really yours so uh, so pack you uh, should have the de dedicated nurses they should have basic knowledge about airway um, bls they should be able to identify critical events and call for help and uh, uh, the ratio of nurse and uh, patient in pack uh, you is usually 1 is to 3 for because they are mostly stable patients what i mean by sick patients where you need 1 is to 1 care is that let's say you have removed a foreign body there are multiple manipulation in the theater you are expecting airway edema this patient when it comes to recovery should be monitored by one nurse all the time so this is just a small video to say you know how we shift a patient 
this uh, she is dedicated in recovery nurse she, he is our anesthetist they have shifted a deep patient they have put in pulse oximeter they are monitoring pulse oximeter and after that they are trying to play, place a ecg so um, in early recovery period is very uh, can be very happening and you must watch for post operative complications they should be under close monitoring by these dedicated nurses then in recovery this early recovery phase we think about uh, feeding especially the smaller ones who are on mother's milk and this that this 1 to 3 age group who starts to be become very jittery if you don't feed them um, or you don't give them water and there is a very important role of parents in early recovery because their presence actually calms the baby down and then everything goes uh, smooth and then uh, they once they meet discharge criteria they are shifted to ward so in this recovery phase you see you 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 may see common complication you may see complications especially the respiratory complications like laryngospasm i'm not going to talk now because i've already covered it airway obstruction they may be hypoventilating because of anesthesia drugs post operative nausea vomiting is the most common recovery room problem then they may be hypothermic they can be emergence delirium these things can happen in recovery so it is really a very happening place and you have to be very careful remember it is not recovery room responsibility is anesthetist responsibility and you are helped by you are helped by the dedicated nurses so airway obstruction they present like a seesaw breathing pattern uh, there will be intercostal indrawing there will be retractions either substernal or, or uh, suprasternal and uh, uh, how do you present uh, prevent it ideally you should have put this patient in recovery if they are deep or uh, some airway uh, goodles airway or nasopharyngeal airway has been put forward put all earlier the culprit of for airway obstruction is most commonly tongue but also epiglottis uh, how should you position in recovery room it should be recovery position but if the patient is supine then you should less than 2 years you should have a shoulder roll and i'll show you why you should i just notice that there is no shoulder roll in this baby and you see uh, we are doing fiber optic and see this is how epiglottis lies and epiglottis is a another level of obstruction so one is tongue other is epiglottis so look at this video where jaw thrust is given and you can see how does epiglottis look see epiglottis you can see an open airway here you can see a nice open airway this is because of jaw thrust and the third video you see there is a shoulder roll so in shoulder roll you see how does epiglottis look see there is still an airway you know you can see that clearly shoulder roll is helping but the best thing is to give jaw thrust but the problem is you can't give jaw thrust in recovery because uh, the child is now waking up he may not allow you to give jaw thrust uh again uh, handing over is a very very important thing for recovery so whatever has happened uh whatever has happened in theater you have to tell recovery nurse because let's say you have this patient where you have multiple attempts and uh, of intubation they have been airway edema and you don't hand over this patient properly and you don't tell nurse to give adrenaline nebulization as per age you have uh, you have not given iv dexa then the patient obviously will undergo a post extubation strider so handing over is important you must anticipate problem and you must initiate treatment even in theater like iv dexamethasone can be given immediately in the theater you should bring this patient with oxygen sub supplementation and you should have given a clear cut instruction of adrenaline let's say if it's a 10 kg baby you will say 0.5 mg ml of adrenaline diluted in 3 ml of normal saline should be given to this baby and you have to document it now this is another which common problem which is actually seen for the first time in recovery room when the patient wakes up nausea vomiting we must know that children have higher incidence of nausea vomiting than adults and this is really also uh, sex dependent age dependent and surgery dependent so the incidence of nausea vomiting can be as high as 50% as you can see and the common surgery is the common uh, culprit surgeries are strabismus um tonsillectomy 
and then you have uh, orchidopexies. Um, once you have nausea vomiting in recovery, uh, you have to ensure that patient does not aspirate. So put them in head low position, recovery position, give them anti-emetics, two drugs anti-emetics like 5-H3 and 5-HT3 antagonist, ondansetron 0.1 milligram or 0.15 milligram per kg. You can give. <clears throat> Now, uh, apart from post-op nausea vomiting, a common, uh, not common, but uh, another important uh, complication seen in recovery is emergence delirium. Incidence is as high as 10%. The best thing about this thing is it's a transient phenomenon. It resolves on its own, but it takes around uh, an hour. What exactly is emergence delirium? It is a mental disturbance during recovery of general anesthesia. Child faces hallucination, delusion, is confused, restless, moaning, and thrashing around. The, pr the problem really is because they thrash around so much that they can actually injure themselves. And it is our job to ensure that they don't injure themselves. And there are various assessment score like PEAT score or VACHA scale, which you can follow and um, you can anticipate whether they are, under they are going to undergo or they are undergoing uh, emergence delirium. The drug treatment choice is dexmedetomine, 0.3 to 0.5 microgram per kg. You can also give propofol, 1 milligram per kg. Now, uh, these are the common problem, problems you see among children when they are very small babies, like you're dealing with a premature baby who's coming for hernia repair. You know, also these patients are recovered in recovery room. So uh, you, you must have some idea about uh, the complications they can have uh, in recovery. So I will not touch too much upon this. Only thing I will say is apnea of prematurity, which means cessation of breathing for 20 seconds or 20 seconds or even less than that with the desaturation and bradycardia is a significant apnea of prematurity. It is seen with preterm, but also can be seen with term baby who are sick. And I will stop here because it, this will take it, uh, otherwise it will take long. Uh, now, uh, now coming to, uh, once you have watched for complications, the children are waking up and, you know, you have to ensure you feed them. You This uh, by default order of give them water after four hours is not a good practice. In fact, the, this age group children, as you can see on your uh, left side, these uh, children actually uh, need water immediately and you must give them. If they are on mother's milk, you must give a feed to them. And it really increases the satisfaction score among children and mother, parents both. You look at this girl. This girl had MRI 15 minutes back. She, you see, she is so wide awake. Is a proper fault. MRI how minutes so she has got 15 minutes back MRI. You can see she has already taken half glass of juice and she is up and above ready to go. So you can discharge them in 15, 20 minutes. So uh, this all can be done. So take home message uh, will be you have to, uh, you know, uh, recovery period is a continuation of your anesthesia. Responsibility is yours. You have to anticipate complications and PACU facility. In case you don't have similar PACU facility as that of OR, you must recover your patients in OT. And the trained nurse are very important for a PACU. So once they, uh, they get their modified elder score more than uh, nine, you can discharge them to ward. So is that all? Once you shifted your patients to ward, remember to follow your patients. You, you should have some kind of acute pain services. If not dedicated, then you must go back and see your patients and look for analgesia management. And remember, if there is any mortality um, in 24 hours after anesthesia, it is uh, anesthesia related. Uh, if there is mortality in child within 24 hours, it is anesthesia related. Uh, mortality. Um, also, very important topic that you need to always remember, which because for which the patient, for which the parents are always worried, is the effect of GA. So you must be ready to answer these kind of questions also. 
So now uh, you must be thinking why suddenly I have moved to chicken biryani. The reason being one, uh, time is going up. Time is up for me. And the other thing which I want to kind of tell from this slide is, you know, the chicken, the rice and the masala are same. But you can have various ways to make your biryani. And not that uh, Arkad biryani is the best biryani or the Hyderabadi biryani is the best biryani. All biryanis have their own taste. So your anesthesia planning can vary and it must vary because variety is good. But your basic steps should be safe and you must ensure the safety with your basic steps. And frills you can add and you can, you know, you can have your own kind of frill to your child's management. Planning and communication is the key and anticipating problem even before the problem is occurring. So anticipating problem is very, very important. And with this, I will uh, end and I'm happy that I finished on time. Thank you. Excellent lecture, ma'am. We really enjoyed it. <laughs> so good. Uh, it was like uh, we have to have a lot of experience to learn all this. Uh, you got everything within this 45 minutes. Uh, especially when uh, I was doing PG and the Semla cream was marketed. I used to think it is going to become easy for uh, me to uh, put a wind fan. Then is, is the time when I realized that the child is not afraid of the pain. It is actually afraid of the needle. Uh, really nice lecture, ma'am. Especially the last slide in Briani. <laughs> uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll take some take up some questions, ma'am. Uh, shall yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, there is one question on how you uh, take up an IV line. Is it before or after induction? Um, so if they allow us to put IV line, we put IV line, but most 90% of the time they don't allow us to put IV line. So it's always, I, um, for me, I think I will say after induction. Okay. Ma uh, there is one question uh, that uh, whether if you use oxygen nitrous oxide uh, together during induction, won't it cause hypoxia? No, no. So if you're giving the nitrous oxide, so if you're not giving 100% nitrous oxide, you see, remember 21% is the oxygen in your, you know, atmosphere. So if you can give 33% uh, oxygen, you're still giving higher oxygen and 21%. So, but if you really want to get second gas effect, you need to have higher concentration of nitrous oxide. Otherwise it will not work. Okay, ma'am. Uh, if you had the choice of having all the induction agents, which would not do you, ma'am? Because you said Tayo, it is not available with you. If you had the choice of everything, what would you I, use, ma'am? I, I will choose Tayo. I will choose Tayo because I think what in, what I notice every day, um, they scream. The children scream more when you give propofol than actually you hold and give IV. It is very painful. Uh, there is one question regarding the ventilator settings for children now, mm -hmm. the mode, the, say, uh, the tidal volume, the settings. So I, I think protective lung ventilation still holds true. Only one thing I, I will say here, uh, one very important fact which we forget is the on your ventilator, the numbers which are shown are shown at uh, the uh, machine end. The numbers, they are at machine end, not at patient end. So if you monitor the ventilator showing for an 8 kg baby, 80 ml, it is 80 ml at patient at machine end. Machine end. And then you have a circuit. You know, this circuit is very pliable. Every time if you keep hand on the circuit, if you give inspiration, the circuit actually dilates. So there is a loss of tidal volume there, which you have to keep an account. And we have been very, very lucky to have many monitors. So your ETCO2 will tell you, your ETCO2 will tell you that you are giving adequate tidal volume or not. Your uh, saturation will tell you whether you are adequate, adequately ventilating. And, uh, and that's it, I think. Yeah. There is one question on a single vital capacity induction, ma'am. Have you tried it? What person should be used? I have not tried. I have tried convincing bigger children. And I, what I have seen is they don't take that vital uh, capacity. So for me, I think maybe in experience or whatever, I have not been able to convince children, one, to take that vital capacity. They become very restless. The more you give instructions, they get restless. Exactly, ma'am. So I have not got experience in this.
there are questions uh, two questions on sublingual some of the dose and the second one is that if, if giving a sublingual will we want that cause a laryngospasm uh that's very good question okay so dose is uh, simple to answer it's equal to iv dose it's equal to iv dose the the, the sublingual part is very vascular so it's okay. and now coming to the second bit uh, yes of obviously you are stimulating in lighter plane you are stimulating in lighter plane but i think you are now when when you are talking about succinctonium you already reach a stage where deep saturation is happening you have already tried fio to 100% you have already tried cpap you have already tried deepening them nothing is working so that is the only thing only way to break the spasm so i think we just go and get yeah. just go and get Okay, ma'am. Uh, there were questions on anti-emetic and uh, emergency relief. Both, both were covered very nicely in, in your lecture, ma'am. Especially the uh, time to feed the child. It's really, ma'am, a very difficult area to assess. You, know, you had covered it very nicely, ma'am. Um, it was a wonderful lecture. Thank you very much, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the next part of the lecture. Uh, to talk about the regional session children we have professor El elsa vargis ma'am welcome ma'am thank you <laughs> elsa ma'am uh, 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 she has been a former professor and hod of kasturba medical college manipal she has done her dn md anesthesia and cmc vellur and her pediatric anesthesiology from detroit in usa she is a, uh, worked as a senior consultant at mit chennai and uh, she has been the past president of uh, iapa she has have had lot of publications in, in her name and she is an eminent speaker more than 100 conferences and that to very uh, uh, elite orations she has given we are proud to have you here ma'am thank you ma'am so uh, uh, good morning everyone uh, can i just share, share my screen and just tell me whether you are seeing it yes ma'am Please? Yes, ma'am. Okay, yes. Just put yours on mute because I can hear the sound from your yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Operating room. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, good morning, everyone. You've had such a profound uh, and wonderful lecture. Uh, you practically learned the whole textbook of of pediatric anesthesia from um, Ekta Rai and uh, peppered with so much of of experience. And uh, today I have been asked to talk about another whole textbook of uh, regional anesthesia in children, and um, I'm going to just uh, run you through it. And uh, obviously, when you want to do a block like this, you you have enough material available for you to check on it uh, before you proceed, and that is absolutely important. So. Um, actually what is the parents and what the child suffers in the post operative period actually can all go um, be annulled if you have not provided what is now considered an absolute vital uh, sign of pain and its treatment so i'm going to dwell on that topic and i hope to cover some of the relevant anatomy physiology and pharmacology very briefly we will then talk about some of the central and peripheral regional anesthetic blocks when you do it how you do it what kind of doses and then we need to also remember that each technique that you use is invariably associated with complications especially if you cut corners and uh, if you're inexperienced and uh, very briefly if i have time i'll cover some of the controversies so let's plunge right in into the anatomical implications and i'm sure all of you are aware that uh, basically the spinal cord in a in in a child in a, a neonate uh, can extend or the corpus medullaris extends right up to l3 and in adult it it you know shrinks up to l1 and what actually happens to the dural sac you see that in a neonate or and and in a it's right up there almost up to s4 and uh, goes back up Uh, in an adult to S1, and this is reached by the age of one year uh, in in a baby. So, what are the implications of this? That uh, because the dural sac ends at S3, S4, and you need an infant, one has to be very cautious, especially when you are providing a 
caudal block because you can actually, you think you're injecting your uh, local anesthetic into the epidural space, but in fact, it will go into the subarachnoid space and you can, uh, since you're giving fairly large volume, you can create a total spinal. So uh, it's important to know that. And also important to know, especially when you provide epidural anesthesia, is that say if this is in an adult, you find the spinous processes are much more inclined and which they're, they're far, far more parallel in a child. So it's actually easier to uh, go by the midline approach when you're providing either a spinal or a new uh, epidural block. When, let's talk about some of the other implications. When you uh, look at the sacrum and the sacroiliac uh, uh, sacrococcygeal ligament, it's much wider in a smaller child. So actually, that's like a magical uh, availability for us as anesthesiologists, which is why this is, uh, caudal blocks are probably one of the most common and most popular blocks because they allow easy access to the epidural space. And um, another important thing to remember is that though there's, we, as we all know, there is fat and there are fat lobules in the epidural space, but the fat is far more liquid in, in uh, children less than eight years of age. And what is this, how, what is in the implication of this? It basically is that when you inject local anesthetic, the, uh, it spreads much more and it aids in the extensive spread of the local anesthetic. Another important thing is actually, when you look at the amount of relative volume of CSF in the subarachnoid space, it's far more in a neonate compared to an adult. And therefore, the implications are, like especially if you're giving a spinal in a smaller child, is that actually you need a higher, uh, you need a higher dose of your local anesthetic because it the central block, you find that uh, the subarachnoid space, if you go by, uh, you know, like what we're classically taught about the intercrystal line, uh, it may not, what we found when you actually check with ultrasound um, guided techniques is that it may not necessarily, the intercrystal line that we use may not necessarily correlate with the actual space. You might actually be, um, it might actually be lower than you think, or it may be higher. So you, uh, uh, you can't really go by that. It's not very really accurate. The other important thing to know is that actually when you look at a, newborn, there's almost like a single uh, curve at birth. And what happens by about six to eight months, you start getting the cervical and the uh, lumbar lordosis, and it reaches this by one year. So basically, you don't have to, um, the positioning is much easier for, for uh, uh, when you're doing a baby. Now, another aspect that I would like to <clears throat> stress, especially when you say you're, you're giving uh, blocks which are close to um, bones like epidurals and like caudals, there is incomplete ossification of the bones. In fact, the neonatal bone is so soft and you might actually, when you're giving a, a, a caudal block, actually go right through the uh, bone and uh, you may not know it because there's less resistance to needles and you can actually cause damage to ossification nuclei. So this is another, you have to be very sensitive. Your fingertips have to be very sensitive to, and to a pop or a change. And, and now with ultrasound guidance, you can actually see what is happening. So um, about actual nerve structures, for obviously uh, in a baby, the nerves are smaller, vessels are smaller, tendons are smaller, and there's much less adipose tissue. And the structures are very close together, they're very superficial. So the implication for us is that they actually cause potential injury to the nerve itself and surrounding structure. And this is where, as Dr. Ekta was saying, you know, with ultrasound guidance, it's amazing how you're actually seeing what you're doing. You're seeing where the actual tip of the needle is and, and therefore you uh, end up having less injury. Now, uh, there is less connective tissue covering on the endoneurium, the actual diameter of the the nerve is smaller, and the myelin sheath is incomplete. And the implication for us 
is that you know you don't have to wait so long. You almost have an immediate uh, sensory and motor block, and uh, but and you can actually use lower concentration of your local anesthetic, and this can give you a prolonged blocking. So these are all very important, important anatomical differences and the implication for us. In terms of, of physiological differences, we all know that the pain perception is very acute, um, right in a neonate, it's, uh, in a fetal cell. But uh, these babies have poor localization. So you can't really use a pinprick technique or whatever to find out where the actual pain is. And uh, so, uh, and the descending inhibitory pathways are uh, not really developed. So, uh, you know, there's suddenly confusing uh, inputs. And there is a marked stress response to acute pain. So, you know, you may think, that uh, post-op pain, what's there? You know, the child's going to be okay um, uh, in two days. But there is a recording in the brain, and it can actually cause a risk of chronic pain syndrome in children, and which you can't really ignore. So you have to understand that the implications of pain um, are really very acute in the, in the child. And we all know, I mean, if you have a child or if you yourself have had a painful procedure in your uh, childhood, you're never going to forget it. And so there are secondary problems to this. So therefore, it's so important that preemptive management of acute pain is an absolute uh, armamentarium that you follow. And therefore, regional blocks play such an important role. When you think of other uh, physiological uh, implications, we all know that uh, the enzyme uh, are, are, um, are, are less available and, and they're uh, inadequate of the breakdown of the drug. So you have longer duration of action. There's less protein binding. So uh, there's more drug available. And uh, this is really important because if you're giving repeated doses, either for epidural or cells or with continuous local anesthetic infusions, you actually have an accumulation of drug and a tendency for toxicity. Um, what the good news is, like for instance, you do not get as significant a hypotension after a central neuroaxis block, especially in the smaller children, because there's reduced lumbar sympathetic efferent component. In terms of pharmacological differences, this follows on from our physiological differences. And as I've already mentioned, you have a faster onset. Uh, shorter uh, duration of effect and uh, and uh, it comes on the onset of action is faster because again you have a, a, a card, increased cardiac output and uh, because of that it's distributed faster and so it has a shorter duration as well and because of the low uh, protein binding you have the free fraction available and this is why we talk about uh, local anesthetic systemic toxicity which for which the immature em enzymes or metallism they don't break down the drugs and therefore children are prone to it i know this is not a very common phenomenon but since we as anesthesiologists give regional blocks and we're doing them more so than ever before we have to be able to recognize this and treat it promptly so what are some of the contraindications? Let's talk about that. Which of the children you are not going to give regional blocks to? Um, I don't know if any of you have had parents who have said, no, I don't want my child to have. I've had at least four parents who uh, I've explained, I'm going to give a block under once the child is asleep. And they said, no, 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 don't go anywhere near the spine. We don't want that. So you have to get consent. It's not just getting consent for GA. If you're giving a block, you have to say, I'm going to be giving a block as well. You need to make sure that where you're giving the block, the skin and is fine and there's no uh, infection. And uh, for instance, when you talk about giving a nerve block that might hinder the surgery, I know there are some surgeons who say working on the on the penis if they're doing for, for hypospadia repair, etc. They feel that if you give a caudal, that it causes uh, en engorgement of the penis, and they say, no, don't give it now give it later. So you have to be aware of what some of the surgeons like and what they don't like. Okay. Um, so relative contraindications are 
For instance, I'm sure all of you have been taught that if there's dimpling or if there's a hairy uh, area around uh, the sacral hiatus, don't give a caudal block. So uh, that is true. But now with the onset of and the, and the use of ultrasound, you can actually check what what uh, is there any underlying neurological uh, abnormality, and based on that, you can decide whether to proceed or not. Obviously, if the bleeding disorders or the children have uh, uh, basic neuropathy, then you have to be concerned about post-op worsening because then you will implicate it on your block. As you know, and you already know, most of you, anyone who's had a spinal or an epidural, if they've ever had backache, even 20 years later, they'll say, remember, I had an injection in the spine, you know, and it's because of the anesthetist. And that's why I'm I'm having the pain. So you have to be very careful. Sepsis, it's uh, important to know, you know, it's not just local infection, but also if the child is in sepsis, uh, this uh, it can actually start um, push infection right into uh, a neural uh, space and make it a, a CNS infection as well. So uh, generally, even, like, even in adults, it's if in sepsis, you try and avoid the spinal. So uh, if you do have any new neurological deficits, then you need to be aggressive and and uh, go ahead and do some image, imaging to ensure that it's not related to your block. And for this, the important thing, as Dr. Uh, Eta mentioned, is you have to follow up your patients and you've got to know or always ask your surgeon or he should tell you if there's been a problem related to your block. So we all know, but I know there are some people who skip uh, some of these basic things, so I can't emphasize that you have to use sterile techniques. What the, the book says that you prefer, preferably use chlorhexidine over povidonidine. Uh, uh, and uh, it's important that for whatever procedure you're doing, you use the appropriate needles uh, so that you don't cause damage to the nerves, for instance, when you're giving peripheral blocks and you have appropriate needles for, for epidurals, uh, for caudals and spinal. And more importantly, don't try tricks on a new baby, especially a small child. Watch somebody who has experience and only then proceed. And one of the crucial things is uh, that you, uh, the known fact that there are more complications when you have inexperienced anesthesiologists providing regional anesthesia for children. And it's so important that you follow the rules and position patients appropriately for the procedure. Um, so let's go into the common neuroaxial blocks in children. I think most of you would have seen caudal blocks. Those who are more experienced working in larger centers uh, um, do epidurals as well in small children, right from neonates up and uh, spinal in, especially in newborns. But I do know that there are several centers that are doing, providing spinals even in uh, older children under sedation. So let's walk ourselves very briefly through this. This is probably the most commonest block that most of us have followed. Uh, it was hardly uh, ever used earlier, but you know, probably from the 90s, it started becoming very popular because it's such an easy technique to use and uh, relatively safe. And uh, so you would use this uh, basically when you want to block anything below T10 uh, mm, dermatome. And we all use it for urological procedures, lower abdominal surgery, pelvic and lower extremity surgery. Um, what are the important landmarks? Uh, for uh, we, It's really, uh, you, you, you feel for the posterior superior iliac spines, and then you you imagine a equilateral triangle defined by these two spines, and this third angle usually lies over the sacral hiatus. So you palpate both the sacral cornu at this location, and you will feel a little depression. And that's when you, if you look at the ultrasound picture, this is the sac sacral uh, sacrococcygeal membrane. So your needle will be coming in at an angle. And then you would uh, flatten it so that it goes into the epidural space. Here you're, you're seeing the uh, 
the you know the cornu of the and this is the where you can see the dura uh, the, uh, ending so um that is the advantage when you use an ultrasound that you can actually see so for as i was saying let's say you have a dimple here or a hairy uh, some hair then you can you put your ultrasound flow probe and put it in a, a, a linear sagittal plane and in the midline and you can actually see the uh, dural sac and so you know that uh, you have a safe space to inject your drug so um most of us don't use a uh, uh, ultrasound for when you're doing a caudal but it does give you uh, information and you can actually see where your needle is what is preferred is that you use a stellated needle but a lot of us use even for cannulas it goes through the space you get a distinct pop and then you inject your drug and depending on the level that you require the uh, uh, volume is what is recommended obviously the older the child but they don't recommend you give more than 30 ml for, for as a total volume and um, lower concentrations are what has been recommended because remember the epidural space is very vascular and you can uh, have a rapid absorption of these drugs uh, nowadays most people prefer ropivacaine over bupivacaine though because of the cardiotoxicity of bupivacaine though you must remember that ropivacaine also can cause problems and if you have the fortune uh, like in in europe of having levobupivacaine then that has uh, less of cardiac pro, um, toxicity however it is extremely expensive now we move on to epidural block this are uh, these are blocks that need to be provided by an experienced anesthesiologist and uh, there are clear indications you can you know for thoracic surgery for instance uh, large centers they even provide uh, epidural anesthesia for tracheoesophageal fistulas etc but those are people who who know how to do it and they know the safe techniques so you can give for much higher uh, and you can actually have selective uh, blocking of nerve but um, one has to be very cautious you can give single shots you can give continuous infusions and in an older child patient controlled as well there is a significant role of in uh, patients with cerebral palsy and uh, those with asthma or respiratory diseases because uh, your uh, you could be using less of your general anesthetic etc now um, one word of caution which uh, when we talk about uh, kind of controversies when you have children who have total pain relief it uh, sometimes uh, and especially if they are having procedures on the lower limb if you have no pain at all you may not uh, one of the earliest signs of uh, compartment syndrome is pain and so uh, there are some controversies that if you provide a uh, you know total analgesia that you may not be able to actually pick up uh, uh, the uh, a compartment syndrome however this is again being questioned and it's uh, it's so important that we do provide these children with adequate analgesia so let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, epidurals as i just you're, you're pushing your needle in and uh, it goes uh, just above uh, in the space just superficial to the uh, dura and you can thread your catheter up you have to use sterile techniques and uh, in children uh, even though it's under general anesthesia for epidural it's uh, it's important you do use a test dose and uh, so they you can position the patient accordingly but the important thing is that you know actually the angulation is not so acute as in adults and you use a uh, lots of resistant technique and um, what is emphasized for children is that you uh, it's much safer especially in smaller children to use air for loss of uh, sorry saline for loss of resistance rather than air and um, there are obviously risks associated with epidural puncture bleeding infection urinary retention etc and nerve injury um pediatric uh, 
Epidural needles, are, they can get special sizes, they're shorter, and they have, uh, narrow, they have more frequent markings than 0.5 centimeters rather than one centimeter, as you see in adults. Now, in terms of depth, usually in a, a, you reach it within a centimeter or maybe even less. Here, you can, it ranges from 0.4. So, you know, if you have to be very, very cautious, you can go right through and, and damage the spinal cord if you're going at a thoracic level. And in older children, you go by about, say, one millimeter per kg per body weight. Um, the test dose that is, re is highly recommended, and you need to wait for an adequate response. And what is the response? Even if you're, if you're using sevoflurane, you need to remember that if you, you would get a transient increase in heart rate or blood pressure, but these are not uh, very accurate. And what if you, within the first 30 seconds, you can see an increase in height of the T wave. So when you are giving an epidural, you have to have your monitor right in front of you and you should be able to see it as you're injecting because it's so transient, you might miss that you are actually injecting into a vascular space. So if you're, you can give continuous uh, epidural analgesia at various levels, and you can insert the caudal catheter. Also, there are a lot of people who insert the catheter into the caudal space and under vision, they push it up to whatever level they want. But one needs to remember that we can go wind around nerve roots and, and cause problems. As uh, And you can add editive as well. And there's standard dosing parameters that you use for neonates, for infants, because you want to avoid last. And remember that uh, every time you're giving a top-up dose, you have to also ask for it. So uh, the initial bolus doses for, children, for younger children is a little different from those who are more than uh, 10 years of age. Uh, and what is recommended is that you use lower concentration of bupivacate. And uh, for thoracic epidurals, you kind of halve the dose of uh, what you would give for lumbar epidurals. And if you're giving a repeat dose, like you don't have pumps and you're giving repeated doses, your repeat dose is half the volume of your uh, uh, initial volume and you need to give it about two hours later. And if you're giving a continuous uh, low dose infusion, you go down to even lower concentration. And important to remember, as I'm, I'm stressing again, that there is drug accumulation, and so you need to look out for toxicity. So uh, there are complications related to catheter insertion. So you avoid pushing it too hard, and you need to evaluate the progress. And uh, it's unclear whether the ultrasound is better than dye. But you obviously you don't want to uh, throw too much radiation to a child. So if you have ultrasound in your room, better. Uh, the common drugs that we use is rupivacaine and bupivacaine. An important thing to know is when do you stop it? If you're giving a continuous infusion, if you're using bupivacaine, you don't re usually recommend its use for more than 48 hours if the child is less than six months of age and uh, Rupivacaine, you can have it for a little longer, three days. Uh, if you have Levo Bupivacaine, uh, you need to use it for a much shorter period of time. Otherwise, you can get uh, problems with uh, overdosing. Adjuncts, we use almost 60% of pediatric anesthesiologists use uh, additives. And the reason they do so is to prolong duration and improve the quality of the block. And the common drugs that they use are clonidine, ketamine, and fentanyl. But you do kind of need to avoid these drugs in neonates as far as possible. And there's no advantage of most of the other drugs that have been tried. So complications are similar. And uh, but there's a lower rate when performed on the ultrasound. And uh, the risk of long-term complications, most have been found in uh, when you use ultrasound that the complications are much lower almost reduced by 50%. And if the important thing is if there's hepatic dysfunction, cardiac dysfunction, or dehydrated child, or hypoproteinemic child, you need to cut down the dose of your drug. Okay, so 
if there are uh, serious uh, complications, the one we worry about most is last, and uh, I won't go into how we treat it. The good news is that uh, very rare complications, what we see is um, commonest, or, and even that in not too many cases of last, respiratory depression, mainly when opioids were used, no case of hematoma or permanent deficit, one case is reported of epidural abscess. Uh, these are the doses, but I suggest you look it up of how what is the initial dose, infusion, but generally the range between uh, one to three mics uh, per kg for rupivacaine, rupivacaine, and uh, infusion doses is half that, and or even lower ones if you don't want more to block. Um, right, we talk about spinals. Now, Awake spinals, these are mainly performed in neonates and sick uh, preterm where you don't want to give a GA and surgery of lower abdomen or lower limb. We found that there were a lot of children who used to come with um, uh, abscesses, you know, who have uh, have with sepsis and abscesses uh, uh, that need to be drained. Neonates, you know, because they've had so many procedures in the neonatal ICU. So we used to give that. And you need short needles and uh, for 25 gauge, and you go in at a lower level, as we mentioned before. It is an underutilized technique. Not many centers use it because it's, you require an experienced anesthesiologist. You need to require a very good assistant to hold the baby. You can either do it in the lateral position or the sitting position, or some centers use the um, uh, frog position. And, and that it, that the bottom doesn't move and you don't have a moving target. We usually put a little bit of Embla clean, cream a little bit beforehand so that the baby doesn't, you don't have to give two pokes. And infants tolerate this well and there's not much of a hypotension. Uh, there was an interesting study where they uh, studied about 500 neonates in infants where they provided uh, spinal anesthesia, short duration, and uh, were very low. Uh, complication rate. And I just need to point out that when you're positioning the baby, you need to avoid lifting up the legs because that's when the level goes much higher. So you don't keep the head down and the legs up, especially if you're putting a cautery plate or whatever. You need to be very careful about that. And remember that if you're giving a sedative along with this, you're likely to have apnea. So uh, not easy to. Uh, do these blocks, and so you need to avoid multiple attempts because you can get bloody taps, total spinals, etc. So a lot of people are moving rather from spinals to caudals in neonates and have a higher success rate. Now dosing is as mentioned here. We use mainly bupivacaine, and uh, this uh, or you give more in in the older child. Okay, well, so what are the big benefits of regional anesthesia? Basically, you're reducing opioid use, much less nausea and vomiting. As, as Ekta said, these children, uh, a retching child, there's just nothing more distressing. And if you look at feedback from parents, most of them say that, you know, the nausea and vomiting was so um, distressing for children. And they reduce the post-op pain scores, much less respiratory complications when you have with opioid sparing. And as mentioned earlier, there's a huge stress response in babies, and this reduces the stress response, and therefore the autoimmune, the immune res, uh, response is better, etc. It reduces the MAC of your inhalational agent, and it also facilitates early and smooth extubation. And um, and if you have, uh, uh, you know, a child, you you've cut down on your anesthetic, you're waking you up, the child already is pain-free. So they've got early post-op pain, pain relief. So we now move on to peripheral nerve blocks in children. Now, no, there were not too many peripheral nerve blocks being performed. Some, some head and neck blocks like infraorbital uh, blocks for cleft lip and palate and uh, uh, palatal um, uh, blocks uh, for, uh, for palate. But otherwise, uh, maybe ilioinguinal, uh, iliohypogastric, but not my, and and maybe supraclavicular blocks. But there's been a huge flood of um, new blocks that have come up ever since the use of uh, 
ultrasound. And uh, so this is the role of these peripheral blocks in multimodal pain control, especially for extremities and lower abdominal incisions, uh, are, are play a huge role. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the truncal blocks. Now, um, these are indicated when you have surgery around the umbilical uh, area uh, and uh, abdominal surgery. And so there are three blocks that have, have become popular now, like this cheap block, transverse abdominal plane block, or what we call the TAP block, quadratus lumborum block. And, and uh, so we'll be talking a little bit about this. And they're fairly easy to give and very low complication rates, especially when you're providing them under ultrasound guidance. So let's talk a little bit about the tap block. So here you have the child, you've gone you're giving it along the just on the lateral aspect of the abdominal wall. It's uh, mainly indicated for lower abdominal surgery because it blocks uh, this C10 to L1. And uh, you don't need too much uh, uh, volume. And what it does is that basically it blocks the skin, the muscle, the parietal peritoneum that is supplied by these um, dermatomes. And uh, so how does that happen? It blocks some of the intercostal nerves, subcostal nerve, iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal nerve. And if you've given enough volume, it usually provides a good duration of action. However, if you go too deep, you can actually enter the peritoneal cavity and you can cause bowel injury, which is why this is a, um, a tap block is, is recommended to be done under ultrasound guidance. So how do we do it? You place your probe as shown earlier, and then uh, you look. So you can use this for, say, appendicectomies, colectomies, hernia repair, um, People, patients who have spinal abnormalities, so you don't want to give a central neuraxis block. And uh, the landmark is you go at the mid axillary line, as uh, uh, we've shown earlier. Uh, uh, here is the mid axillary line. And uh, you find that the lumbar nerves, they, uh, these rami, they lie in the intermuscular plane between the internal oblique. Here you can see the internal oblique muscles. And this is the, uh, uh, sorry, this is the uh, transverse abdominus muscle. So you this, if you've injected into here, the, or your drug is going to go into the abdominal cavity, you need to inject into the muscle over here. And the important thing to remember is it provides unilateral anesthesia to the skin, muscle, parietal peritoneum of the anterior abdominal wall. So if you're having surgery that's likely to cross on the other side, you need to give a bilateral block, and which means you need to calculate your total dose so that you don't go beyond the toxic dose. Now, rectus sheath blocks, these are really indicated for surgery around the umbilicus. Um, fairly small doses required and uh, they it really uh, uh, it's along this whole midline abdominal um, if you're having a midline abdominal incision but so you have to I mean I'm not sure if some surgeons don't want any distortion here then they may not be happy with it but it's a useful drug but again you can very easily so you go you inject your needle he's the here you're holding the needle and it's progressing and you just, uh, this is the posterior aspect of the rectus sheath, and you're just injecting your drug up there. Femoral nerve blocks, um, the drug that we use very commonly in adults. I don't know how many have been using it in children, but any surgery uh, of the here, this is the uh, inguinal uh, uh, crease, any surgery of the anterior thigh, femur, patella, the knee. Or if child has had a fracture of femur, it's very useful that you can pop that in pre-op. And uh, so it really helps reduce the pain in, in any trauma in this area, provided the skin is intact. Um, this is the dosage. And it really gets it, derives its roots from uh, L2 to L4. And uh, so it's the anterior medial thigh, the knee, the medial part of the leg, and the medial part of the foot. Um, 
So complications here is that remember it lies very close to the artery and you need to be cautious. So if you look at this, you're giving it at the level of the femoral crease. And uh, here you notice that the nerve is hyperechoic. So that means well, that means you're seeing it not as dark, but you're seeing it as a light as whitish, and it lies just below the fascia. This is your fascia iliaca, and it lies immediately lateral to the artery. So you have what is the nerve, the artery, the vein. Then there's a little bit of space, and there's the lymphatics. So you, it's really important that you remember that you're so close to the artery that you can very easily inject it there especially if your needle is moving or has, you know, if you're going in this direction, you can very easily, few millimeters and you're in the artery, you need to be very careful about that. Um, we move then to the fascia iliac block, which is a three-in-one block. And basically what you're doing is you're giving a larger volume and you're blocking three nerves, the lateral, the femoral nerve, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, the operator nerve. And the, so this can be used for hip fractures. And uh, accurate placement along the femoral nerve is very important because the whole idea is that it spreads, the local anesthetic should then spread. All the, that's where your needle tip is. It should give a good volume. It spreads la cordially, laterally, medially, and it blocks these nerves. Uh, popliteal sciatic nerve is, uh, again, uh, for, for procedure, the, here you need to have the child lateral or uh, prone and uh, you need to identify the popliteal artery, the popliteal vein. And then you uh, move your probe up towards the, uh, uh, track the nerve up above the popliteal fossa. And then you will see the uh, common peroneal nerve, tibial nerve, very small, again, slightly hyperechoic uh, bundles that you can see here. And you need to be very cautious again that you don't inject it into the uh, vein or the artery. There has been a case report of, of an adult patient where a popliteal block was given and bupivacaine was injected and this patient had a seizure and uh, could not be resuscitated. In fact, had to be put on a um, uh, heart-lung machine for several hours. So please remember that one has to be very careful about this and you need to give capture both these nerves. If you go too low, you might miss one of them. Supraclavicular, we now come to upper limb blocks. Supraclavicular block, probably again, one of the commonest uh, used blocks for, especially if you're using ultrasound guided. There are a number of, uh, some uh, people who prefer the infraclavicular block uh, using again, ultrasound guidance. And uh, it really is an easy block and it provides good analgesia for the entire arm. And you need to block basically the roots of C5 to T1. And uh, uh, it covers most of the upper extremity, but spares the suprascapular nerve. You can put in catheters, so they, uh, preferably not to that. You probably go in for uh, preferred in ankle V but you can put in a catheter. And one of the important things that at all times you've got to hear, I don't know if you noticed, but you can see that this bundle of nerves are not hyper echoic. So nerves don't necessarily always look dense. They can actually look dark. So uh, you have to identify the uh, artery, the subclavian artery, and go medial to that. And the important thing is that you're very close to the first rib. You can very easily puncture, go either into the artery or you can go into the pleura. So you need to be aware of that and check get x-rays done. So uh, basically you place your probe above the clavicle. This is the head, that's the clavicle. And you identify the artery and you find that the plexus is just superior and posterior to it. And uh, and you don't start the block unless you clearly identify the rib and the pleura, before, and uh, you maintain the pleura and view because remember it's a moving structure because otherwise you can cause pneumothorax. Erector spinae block is um, this is uh, performed as you can see here, just lateral to the spine, and uh, 
that would be an indication if you have a rib fracture, some high thoracic surgery, in which case you'll have to give both sides. And it has a very good safety profile. Basically, you, uh, you are blocking the ventral and dorsal rami of spinal nerves and they diffuse back from the site of injection. So if you have here, you have the, um, I'll show you what, what the transverse process. You can see the transverse process. You identify that and then you target the facial plane just deep to the muscle. And you uh, have to orient your probe lat in the longitudinal direction, direction. And you slowly scan from medial to lateral. And then you see this hypoechoic transverse process, hypoechoic transverse process here. And that's where you inject. And uh, you should see spread, a good spread of the, uh, the muscle. As, and uh, then you inject your drug. These are some of the uh, doses, indications. So tap block, which you remember you give in the mid axillary line, this uh, subcostal for lower abdominal surgery. And uh, uh, most of them you're giving an average dose of about 0.2 to 0.5 ml per kg per side if it's a rectus sheet or a tap block and uh, for femoral as well. Popliteal is good for foot and ankle surgery. Uh, supraclavicular for up, upper extremity and uh, these are some of the complications as I've already mentioned. So there's some controversy of you know central versus peripheral block and I think generally the feeling is go as central as necessary but as peripheral as possible because obviously the more central you go the more damaging if you do have complications. And uh, this was an interesting study where they looked at complications in France and they found that uh, central blocks, there's more problems with epidural compared to spinal, compared to caudal and peripheral blocks far less. So if most of the time it occurred, these, these problems occurred with due to at the time of needle placement, so it is either in the nerve sheath, etc., and some of them occurred once the needle is in place. There were visceral punctures. Seizures also have been noted. So, a uh, big advantage, I think, is that we are all really happy, and I know that uh, now a number of of institutions and anesthesia departments have got ultrasound machines because they really make a huge difference because you're seeing and you see and you believe, provided your mind knows what you're seeing and your brain knows, has the knowledge. So before you give a block, just go online, check what structures you're looking for, and then you can make a huge breakthrough in providing regional anesthesia. And success rates are much better, less complications, easy to use. And you'll find that, you know, if you, you uh, patients and parents are so much happier. And uh, so there are many uh, advantages of, for instance, uh, studies where they've compared where you use the um, classic landmarks compared to ultrasound guided and found that uh, ultrasound guided had much higher uh, success rates and um, less analgesic supplementation. Because remember, most of these blocks are given in children under general anesthesia. So, in conclusion, begin to start using regional anesthesia techniques whenever possible. That's the take-home message. But you have to learn the art of ultrasound-guided assisted regional anesthesia. We all struggled. Nobody taught us. You know, you got a machine, you looked up the literature, looked what structures you're looking for. And, uh, you know, you've got to do this in your spare time. Try out on your friends. Try out on on uh, baby, um, babies when uh, you know, you're waiting for the surgeon, et cetera, you'll get the time. And the important thing is keep within your dose limits of local anesthetic. Though uh, local anesthesia systemic toxicity is rare, it does occur. And when it occurs, it can be disastrous. And so you need to be always on the lookout that you do not create the situation. And therefore, I can't stress that you don't just give a block somewhere without monitoring. You need to monitor your patients. You need to follow up. How many of us actually follow up? Because 
Interestingly, when they've looked at closed claims uh, in cases in, in the US, they found that, you know, now anesthesia is so safe. You hardly have any respiratory problems, cardiac problems, the rest now that we don't use um, you know, the safer drugs, we are using safer drugs. But there are case reports of problems after regional anesthesia. So you need to be very careful and get interested and follow up on your children when you have time. Um, this is a very satisfying process. I remember getting so excited when we I used to borrow, you know, ultrasound machines, go down to the radiology department to learn uh, even before we got ours. And then you, you start trying it out on and you realize like I was doing so many ilioinguinal blocks. And then I realized, you know, you get the pop, but actually your needle's gone through the peritoneum and you don't know it. So I started learning that actually I can recognize it once with, a, with the ultrasound probe. And there's nothing more satisfying than a comfortable child and happy parents. Thank you. Golden word, ma'am. <laughs> really. Thank you very much, ma'am, for this exhaustive lecture. It was very nice hearing you through all the safety uh, precautions we have to take, the central neuroaxial blocks and the peripheral blocks. Uh, one personal question, ma'am. The yeah. one major pediatric case, what we get, uh, it's so simple is circumcision, ma'am. How do you manage circumcisions? I give penile blocks. I haven't, I mean, I couldn't obviously cover all blocks, but uh, okay. I give penile blocks. And um, at one time, uh, unfortunately, in, in neonates, you know, actually, the, I used to try giving, uh, putting Emla cream beforehand. When you put Emla cream beforehand, uh, before you actually have that also helps. And uh, I, the older child, I avoided giving cordles because, you know, they start running around uh, soon after when they're okay and then they're not yet stable on their feet. So if you're thinking of, you know, that's where I'm saying you go periphery rather than centrally and then uh, give them round the clock paracetamol and... Uh, uh, there, I actually came across one case report, I mean, where a group where they actually apply Emla cream afterwards, but then there is a concern about methemoglobinemia, especially in neonates. So, you know, if you are trying to use that technique, it also helps uh, uh, smooth the post-operative period, but you've got to monitor um, saturations and be aware of that. Yes, so, ma'am. But that's a very important question because, you know, that is a very, very painful procedure and the boys are so uncomfortable. So you tend to use a combination of uh, IV um, or, rect or rectal uh, uh, paracetamol and, uh, and some amount of uh, uh, trying, try and avoid opioids, of course. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, what uh, additive do you prefer for a caudal, ma'am? Suppose a child has a, a hydrocele or an uh, inguinal hernia operation done. Uh, most of the time, we won't have the uh, 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 luxury of putting a catheter inside. So we rely on uh, using a, a additive. So what do you prefer, ma'am? I think now it's boiled down to clonidine. <laughs> most people just use clonidine. Because okay, there is some, you know, one is always worried about, because um, it is a central block, you're not, you know, so other drugs like midazolam and uh, ketamine, ketamine. So I think the most popular one is clonidine now. And you don't really see the bradycardias that you do, the dose that you do. Okay, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, there is one question about the sizes of uh, epidural or uh, nerve block catheters. Is there anything uh, uh, specific for children? Uh, I, I'm not sure. Is, 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 uh, Ekta can Ekta help me on that? I'm not 100% sure about catheter size. Are yeah. you aware? Yeah, ma'am. For less than 10 kgs, uh, usually we use 20 gauge, 5 okay. to 10 kgs with 24 gauge catheter. Mm. And then uh, less than 20 kgs, we use 19 gauge. I think the catheter is 22 or 23 uh, size mm. and uh, more than 25 kgs we use uh, normal 18. Normal, yeah. 18. And I think uh, generally what they recommend is you don't push the catheter in more than about 3 centimeters or so. That is what is generally recommended, which is why 
um, you know, this whole idea of pushing caudal catheters all the way up, there are concerns. Uh, but, you know, in our situation where somebody is not comfortable putting an epidural and they'd rather put it through the uh, caudal, uh, mm-hmm. it can be done. But as I say, you know, you have to be very cautious when you pull it out. And also you need to tunnel. You need to tunnel the catheter and bring it out more to the side. And the reason being is that you're more likely to get, you know, the cont- site contaminated and infection, which can spread. Uh, is post-operative urinary retention a problem when we use caudal or spinal, ma'am? Because in adults we see, sometimes mm-hmm. even in pediatrics, the surgeons keep telling this could be because of that. Uh, yes, it can, but I think, uh, I mean, it hasn't been uh, too much of an issue. It hasn't been too much of an issue. I think I've just seen one child where we actually had to put in a small little uh, red wrapper catheter to drain, but otherwise I haven't really seen not it's not a big problem that has been reported what is what's been great is that if you use a lower vol, uh, concentration then you have the analgesia and you don't have motor blockade and these children are happy running around but you have to ensure especially if it's daycare that you the child is always accompanied by you know they're not running and they suddenly lose their muscle tone so which is why i think people are going more away from uh, cordles and into um, more peripheral blocks. Yeah, central when necessary and peripheral whenever possible. That is yeah. uh, <laughs> the golden bird map. We yeah. have to follow it. Yeah, but okay. you know, it's so easy to do a cordle. So, you know, you tend to pop it in. But as uh, time went on, I started, uh, once you get used to doing other blocks, you start uh, moving away from that. Ma'am, equal, having done uh, ultrasounds for adults and ultrasounds for uh, children, do you hmm. find that uh, uh, there is any uh, uh, differences in the tissue differentiation, ma'am? Do you have any? Because I do find that sometimes the facial planes are uh, well seen with uh, the children yeah. than adults because of the less fat in the subcutaneous tissue sometimes. Do you have yeah. that? Uh, yeah, but I think it's again, I, every case that you do, I mean, now I haven't practiced for some time, but I, I'm sure Ekta will agree with me that I always confirm what is the anatomy I'm supposed to find. And then I go there, you know, so uh, in fact, so then I, I can say, okay, and I'm not so sure. And then you go back to uh, checking again. And is this what I'm supposed to see? Am I using the probe ROM? Am I using the long, wrong kind of technique? So one, it's, a, it's so much of uh, living and learning, you, which knob to, to uh, fiddle with. Am I right, Ekta? Yes, yes, ma'am. I completely agree. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, sometimes you just pick up the probe and then you don't have the right settings or you, etc. So you, but I always confirm my anatomy, you know, this is what I should be seeing. And then uh, it just pops out when you, you when it's clear. Mm, that is another golden word, ma'am. Before, mm. before putting in the needle, confirm your anatomy. So we have got a lot of golden things from you, man, today. No, you just never stop learning, uh, doctor. You, you kind of, uh, you look. And, you know, because I mean, you're doing so many blocks and so many other things. So it's at that time you're concentrating. What should I see? How should I hold my probe? Which probe should I use? Do I need to change the probe? You know, all those things are there. Uh, you don't just pick up the machine. Some other probe might be on it. You, know, you realize you're using the wrong probe. So there's no uh, easy way out. It's uh, But it's a very exciting journey, um, which I embarked on late in my career. And I found it very exciting. And I think now there's so many more blocks that we, we can use. And that's uh, very useful. I think the uh, time is up. I hope yes, I'm glad. I kept uh-huh. the time. I, I wasn't sure. You gave me uh, something I can write a textbook on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but today, we really, we had a very uh, mind-exploding session today, ma'am. Both of you were uh, uh, two pillars in this field, uh, giving a very nice lecture. It was, uh, yeah, all of us, we felt very happy, ma'am. Uh, thank once you. Again, thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you for this very kind invitation. I know that Dr. Uh, you took a lot of trouble to locate me. <laughs> I got a call <laughs> from... The- from the Bellari asking whether he could call me. So thank you for seeking me out. And I hope I uh, was useful to you and, and postgraduates who are listening. Thank you very oh, much. Thank you, ma'am. On behalf of Online Anastasia, we thank Ekta Rai, ma'am, and Elsa Vargis, ma'am, for coming to the session.
and generating us with uh, this uh, very good uh, topics thank you very much ma'am thank, thank you, you. thank you for the invite thank you so much goodbye thank you, thank you. goodbye ma'am